Every revolution starts in the minds of the people. Arm yourself for the war of ideas. Take back your life. Take back your liberty. Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tom Mullen Talks Freedom. Today, my guest is Jason Rink. Jason is an award-winning producer and director of documentary films. He has over a decade of commercial filmmaking experience and has worked with A-list talent and celebrities like Academy Award-winning actor Richard Dreyfus, U.S. Senators, and even presidential candidates. Jason's also worked with global brands such as Aston Martin, Toyota, Mazda, and Mercer. Lately, Jason has focused more and more on documentary storytelling on unapproved subjects, or in his own words, things that get me canceled. Jason, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be with you, Tom. Thanks for having me on. Well, I guess if you wanted to get yourself canceled, you couldn't pick a better subject than the so-called insurrection on January 6th. You've got a new film coming out called Q Sent Me. What's it all about? Well, yeah, you know, Tom, I think it's really interesting. I, I, I see about three three uh, topics that'll get you canceled pretty fast. One has to do with talking about the uh, the the uh, pandemic, as it were, uh, and all things associated with that. The other one has to do with talking about uh, the November third election, and the third is January sixth. And uh, one thing that I've noticed is, you know, we've got films we're producing on two of those topics right now. Q sent me being the one on the sixth, and you know, I've noticed that these three topics have a lot in common, which is that the media storyline or the media narrative uh, that's being put out there by, you know, corporate media, big tech, the censorship and all the things that are happening. And then the, the word we're getting from the permanent political class about these events is really so detached from reality. And so that's what I wanted to cover with this film, specifically in the film Q sent me, it is the exclusive story of the Q shaman, Jake Angeli or Jacob Chansley, you know, the guy with the horns and the face paint who found himself in the middle of the Capitol uh, in Mike Pence's chair and, uh, you know, has become sort of an international meme as a result. So he's the focus of that film. And, and I'd love to talk to, to you guys a little bit about, you know, how it's developed and what's going on with that. Well, let me tell you, when I first saw the footage and before I knew that you actually had been able to interview this guy, the, the, the first thing I was thinking was, please, 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 please don't be a Buffalo Bills fan. <laughs> but <laughs> it turns out he isn't. He's from California. But is he an insurrectionist? Was he trying to overthrow the government that day inside the Capitol? Well, you know, it's funny. Um, and he's actually, he's from the West, you know, the West, but it's actually Arizona. He is a unique character. You know, me and my co-director in November decided to go follow a story about the election protest movement. And the reason being was, you know, being involved in Ron Paul's campaign in 07, 08, seeing the Tea Party happen after that. I, I started to see sort of Tea Party vibes and what was happening with MAGA in the aftermath of the election. And I would say Tea Party vibes, uh, but with a more anti-establishment streak in it. And so I thought, you know, this is interesting. This is going somewhere. So we decided to follow that story. And it was while we were following that story around the country that we met this guy, this interesting looking guy, obviously, in Arizona. And then we ran into him again in December in D.C. And he was dressed differently, but he was like beating a drum and chanting in front of the Supreme Court. <laughs> And we were like, this is an interesting fellow. So we like, let's just go ahead and interview him, see what he's all about. So we did a short sit down with uh, Jake Angeli back then in December. This is before anybody had any idea who this guy was. Most people had not seen this guy. He was sort of a local curiosity in Arizona and had, you know, followed this, this election protest movement around the country. Um, well, then when we were there filming on January 6th, because we were covering, again, the, the election movement, when things happened at the Capitol, you know, I was like 100 yards from the Capitol the whole time that that went down. We, you know, just like the rest of the world, saw this picture come online of this guy with the horns and the face paint. And I received a text from my co-director. He's like, wow, Jake got in there. And so it, well, it didn't take us very long to realize, you know, if we can interview this guy, it'd be really incredible. 
And so we just texted him and, and sure enough, on the morning of January 7th, he sat down with us for over an hour, told us his story. And what people will find that's, I think, very interesting about this guy is how articulate he is, how well-spoken, how, though he has many unconventional ideas, uh, likely many people in your audience would find themselves nodding their head to many of the ideas that you would talk about that are that have more to do with the nature of government and you know the globalist nature of the permanent political class and the erosion of of liberties and freedoms in America. And the other thing is is he's he comes off very likable. And honestly, the more we got to find out about him, very very peaceful in, in the way that he carries himself through the world. And so in that interview, which was his unguarded interview telling us what happened before he thought he was going to be in any trouble, he had no idea that he was going to be arrested two days later. At that moment in time, he thought he didn't do anything wrong. He said, you know, I went through an open door. That, that's the people's house. You know, I pay taxes. I can go in there and I can go have my grievances addressed. <laughs> and so that's what I think is, is most interesting about him. And, and the other thing that's interesting is that uh, just last week, Jake was sentenced. He pleaded guilty to the offense, the felony of essentially interrupting Congress. It was called uh, obstructing an official proceeding, which carried with it a possible 20 years in prison, but he was able to get, awa get away with only 41 months uh, and he's now getting ready to to start serving that time. And so it, it's it's useful to note that he was not charged with insurrection. He was not charged with sedition. He was not charged with anything violent. the The strongest charge they could bring against him was interrupting an official proceeding and and that's what he was eventually pled guilty to. I seem to remember many left wing groups, sometimes, full of uh, young people or all women or all whatever, interrupting Congress quite a bit over <laughs> the course of my lifetime. It, it didn't used to be so, I guess, because this was connected to Trump's allegations that the election was fishy, that that made this more serious somehow? Or what is the argument the government has against what he did? Well, a couple of things I think are really interesting to note, and, and, and one of the reasons I think this story is so important for libertarians and people who might not qual qualify themselves as like a, a MAGA Republican. And so I, I think there can, can tend to be this, this thing that people will do is they will dismiss something that doesn't seem to personally affect them, or they're able to write off, you know, the Q shaman is kind of an idiot who believed in conspiracy theories. And, and yet what we have seen is the, the arrest of over 600 people, 200 possibly who have been in solitary confinement without bail, uh, with no trial dates scheduled for going on a year. Jake was 317 days incarcerated before getting his sentencing hearing. He, he didn't have a trial scheduled. The Department of Justice has not released 14,000 hours worth of video footage they have, and they've been slow walking the discovery uh, to these defendants. Many of them haven't received discovery of, of any significant kind around their, the crimes they're charged with. And so, and all of this has been sort of excused. The speedy trial laws and things have been sort of waved away. COVID has been used as a pretext to keep people in solitary. A lot of different things have come together to create a situation where you've got civil rights violations going on of American dissidents, essentially, those who would take issue with something that happened or that they perceived happened in the government that took away their right to have their the, the elected president in their eyes be seated and the Department of Justice and the and the federal government is, has weaponized everything that it can to take these people out and everything also including the inability for the for alternate stories to get out. And so we actually launched a trailer for this film in late January, well actually about 10 days after the 6th. And it was removed from Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, and I was permanently suspended. Uh, my personal accounts were uh, back then just for putting a documentary trailer out on this guy. 
And just now I've had my ad accounts, you know, restricted. So we can't actually do any traditional marketing around this film because our story isn't going to be the same story that HBO is going to tell and, and that CNN is going to tell. We're seeking to do something that's got more journalistic integrity and say, hey, listen, what's really going on here? And who is this guy really? And is, is he the Osama bin Laden of January 6th, you know, uh, which is what he's been called uh, by people that we were sort of pitching this project to. And so I definitely think it's the political nature of Trump and the Trump movement and how Trump has to be completely destroyed, prevented from ever running again. And his whole movement has to be reduced to like uh, ineffectiveness in any way that they can because of the threat that it poses to the establishment, in my opinion. And uh, so I think that's, a, that's really what we're seeing with January 6th. And I think just like um, back when 9-11 went down, though you can have any opinion you want about 9-11, but what is un, you know, we can't argue that they had Patriot Act ready to sort of trot out to the American people for just such an occasion. And I think what we're seeing is the, the trotting out of Patriot Act 2.0 was ready for just such an occasion. And they're using that occasion in order to wage a domestic war on terror to those who are problematic for the regime, let's say. You know, I'm so glad you brought up Osama bin Laden because I was actually thinking of him when you were talking about how your, your advertising was shut off and you're deplatformed widely for, for interviewing this, this gentleman because we used to interview Osama bin Laden and put him on every network, right? And uh, he was the most evil guy in the world, according to the regime. And, and then when the uh, president of Iran, not the current one, but the, the last one, you know, we used to have him interviewed and he was allowed to get his views across and he was a Holocaust denier and all these terrible things. But to just interview this gentleman, you haven't said you agree with him or disagree with him. You're a documentary filmmaker. How come we're not even allowed to hear from him? Yeah, it, 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 and it is really incredible. And, and I, th I think one thing that I've come to really recognize is that I think that the permanent political class and the cathedral and the regime, I think they're really, really scared. I think that they recognize that they no longer actually control the, control the narrative and the channels of, of media uh, for, for people. And it's slipped away and it's slipping away. And as much as they try to, to stamp it out, it sort of is like this whack-a-mole where, you know, the internet can't be shut down. Like, you know, we, we'll get around it. And so, but the narrative is critical. Like they need people to think that as Joe Biden said, the citadel of democracy, you know, was attacked on that day. And that, and, and they need people to not consider what it, actually would have like a military grade group of people to try to seize the Capitol that day. I mean, it, it, it is really in many ways a joke to, to when you see the photos of, of people inside walking inside the velvet ropes and the stanchions and like, <laughs> you know, there's footage of Capitol Police like fist bumping rioters. And then Jake led a prayer from the Senate chamber while there was a Capitol Police officer in there. And, and yet there's no uh, gun charges, you know, there's no, uh, it, it's like, there aren't sedition charges. And it's like, I, I, I remember being there that day and I was like, you know, a dozen Blackwater trained individuals could have taken this whole place and held it for a long time. We've got, you know, the MAGA grannies and uh, a dude wearing a Viking costume, you know, and, and, and literally when I was there and saw it go down, when you had all these people hanging off the scaffoldings and waving America first flags and like in this crazy outfits. I was like, this looks like the insurrection by uh, National Lampoon's Animal House or something. Like, it did not. <laughs> I, there was no fear. I, I, and again, I was, I really was a, an observer. You know, like I was making a film, and and I was like, this is really crazy. But you know, it's just that the narrative has to be preserved. And so I think anything that challenges because of what is to be accomplished through the narrative, that what is to be accomplished through the narrative has not yet been accomplished. And so the narrative has to be maintained until what is 
to be accomplished using the narrative is accomplished. And that is the severe curtailing of our freedoms. It is the severe uh, curtailing of being able to express ourselves in free and fair elections to the degree that you even believe those matter to begin with. Uh, the ability to have our voices heard and protest our government. You know, there's a lot of things that are going to come out of these trials that, uh, and these pleas that are going to set precedents for people who are going to go protest in the future. And I think people on the left and Democrats are completely, they've lost their minds if they think that this, the setting these precedents when Joe Biden's in office is going to be good for them if and when either Trump gets reelected or somebody like him or worse from an authoritarian standpoint. It, it just, it makes no sense if you think logically through it. And that's why you realize no logic is not what's happening here. This is about power. It's that time of the year again, when we're all looking for something special to give friends and loved ones for the holidays. Unfortunately, the government and its bank have worked especially hard this year at doing what they do best, make things more expensive for the rest of us. Well, I have great news. You can get a free copy of my new ebook, An Anti-State Christmas. That's my gift to you in appreciation for listening. But that's not all. I've also made the book available as a paperback at an incredibly low price, so you can get a few copies to give as gifts. It makes a great stocking stuffer. And don't worry, this is not some preachy libertarian treatise. It's full of fun and even includes a special Christmas beverage recipe. Get more information and your free ebook at antistatechristmas.com. We help each other when we don't mean to. That's what we call the invisible hand. Something no politician understands. Just leave it up to supply and demand and follow the golden. Yeah, I think you're right. And I mean, certainly anyone who's seen the footage of Jake walking in there with his, his get up, and then I think he sits in the uh, president of the Senate's chair and, you know, he's kind of smiling and there's, there's cops in the room and they're just, nobody could possibly believe that this was going to threaten our system of government, right? And, and you know, I even said this at the time while it was going on and people started using these insurrection terms and everything. It's like, okay, the federal government has 4 million employees. And as we just saw with the, the last four years, with the last president, it really, like you said, doesn't matter who you elect. They're going to do what they're going to do regardless. And the idea that something these people that went inside the Capitol building could do would suddenly result in 4 million federal employees taking orders from Donald Trump instead of Joe Biden that's just ludicrous. No rational person could believe it. But I want to suggest, I totally agree with you on the national security state. They just hate the fact that we can say what we like and do what we like. And I think for a lot of other people, the millions of other people who might support this, there's almost a religious aspect. And I, I hear a lot of conservatives say this, and you know, I've never been a conservative, but I believe they're right about this, that government has replaced religion for a lot of people. And I remember that it might not have been when Jake was in the Senate room. It might have been when one of the other protesters was in the, um, the Congress, Congressional Chamber, the House, where the cop was actually saying, wait, 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 this is actually the most sacred part. He used the yeah. word sacred, right? And that was what he was worried about, this, this cop. You know, I'm not attacking him personally, but he believed there's some kind of sacrilege by an ordinary guy sitting in, you know, a, a sacred chair. And now you put the buffalo horns on and the kind of uh, almost uh, quasi-pagan Brahmin, whatever you want to call it, it's almost ironic as a parody, you know, that he's thumbing his nose at all of this. And it almost seems like to some of the establishment that this is the worst part of it, that they desecrated our temple. Yeah, you know, and I think, Tom, really that. To me, that's the ultimate, like, I don't want to say ultimate, but the red pill that I think that it'd be useful for a lot of people to take is this idea of recognizing that, in fact, it's the state that has replaced God 
and has now a re religion and is carrying out a crusade to convert people to that religion, which is actually what's happening. And so this is beyond right and left. It's beyond Republican Democrat, because it's like, listen, look, we have our temples. They're all those places there in Washington, D.C. You go out to Mount Rushmore, you can see the saints, you know, uh, or going to the Lincoln Memorial. There's a saint there, you know. Um, you can go and see that you've got Rachel Maddow and, um, you know, Sean Hannity are the televangelists for the state. The pastors, you know, tend to be the school teachers that are sort of educating on the doctrines of the state. You know, you've got the the Pledge of Allegiance that's, you know, mandatory in schools or whatever, or that's, you know, at at ball games or whatever. And it's like, you know, that's like, again, just pledging allegiance to this thing called the state really is what that's all about anymore. And so you go down the list and it's like, oh yeah, we wage crusades to spread quote unquote democracy, um, you know, that cause violence. And, you know, we send uh, people, you know, into war and, and that's human sacrifice. Like you could really just break the whole thing down. And it's like, it is a religious system and there is a religion and Depending on what is is to be accomplished, um, I think the left or the right ends up becoming sort of the vehicle to push that next religious fervor together. And, you know, what we've seen over the last 18 months has been a series of sacraments and religious ideas that go around, um, you know, science and scientism and around this very elusive virus that now we've got to take a dozen different injections to get back to normal. So, you know, it's it's really, I think if people can wake up to that and be like, man, this is actually a religion here and recognize it like any other religion that people might accept or reject in the past, that's got the same set of like consequences and social dimensions to it. And, and I would say the other thing too, and this is where I, one of the reasons why I found myself getting involved in sort of the MAGA Trump movement um, from the standpoint that I was documenting it and I was interested in it, was I also came to realize that because the left has the big tech, woke corporate, Hollywood, um, regime media, academia in its back pocket, the errors of the left, and I don't even want to call them errors, they're not errors, but the, 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 where progressivism and the left can take us when it comes to totalitarianism and destruction of liberty, they can take us there much more quickly and effectively than the right can because the right does not have all of those cultural shaping institutions. Um, I think that will change. But so when I was sort of looking at where things were going in the aftermath of Trump 2016, moving into 2020, you know, I personally recognized that I thought that a Joe Biden administration was going to be more dangerous for personal freedom and liberty than a, a second Trump administration and, uh, you know, acted accordingly, I guess I would say, because I really wanted to sit, look, I wanted to buy time. I was trying to figure out if I personally was ready for us to be in a totalitarian reality. And I was like, there's some things I don't have quite buttoned up in my life and the lives of the loved ones around me. And so I think we're in defense mode and trying to trying to buy time, frankly. And so to the degree that I may support or get on the side of a Republican candidate or a policy or something like that, it doesn't have so much to do with my libertarian philosophy as it does my seeing where the greatest immediate threat to liberty is and how we can sort of curtail that. It's funny because when you look at, at Trump, you take away his Twitter feed and you mute his video so you can't tell what he's saying and just look what he did. And Trump was pretty conventional. I mean, that's my problem with him. He's supposed to be this firebrand, this revolutionary. I mean, he doesn't disagree with any of the huge entitlements, not going to touch those. He doesn't really disagree with the worldwide military empire. He says, we need the biggest military in the world, but you don't have to use it all the time. And I give him credit for that. Okay, that is better than Barack Obama and George W. Bush. But it's not this, I mean, the reaction against him, <laughs> that he was going to enforce the immigration laws a little more strictly, which I'm not sure he enforced them more strictly than Obama did. I think Obama still has the record for deportations. So, I mean, it, it, it's just so disproportional that he said a few irreverent things. And basically, that's all he did. And again, it gets me back to this idea that 
you know, you don't even have to change much if you just question the orthodoxy. And and for all of the um, agnostics and atheists li listening out there, believe me, we're not Bible beating, you know, Christian conservatives saying we've got to get God back into our whatever. We're saying, look, if you're going to believe in a religion, don't believe in the religion of government. That's the worst one. I mean, it's got the worst results. Okay. It's never done anything well. We had a 50 year war on drugs. And at, in the 50th year, the government itself said we have an opioid epidemic. Okay. That's their words, not ours. Right. So they're, they're out there proclaiming their failure. So please, you know, if, if anything else, if we could shake the religious faith in government, that would be an accomplishment. I agree. You know, we're in defense mode. Of, we're just trying to do that at this point. The lights came on for me too, about something that goes, goes into this whole religious idea as well. You know, like Curtis Yarvin, Moldbug, you know, he had this series of articles that he wrote called i forget now it's super popular i'm forgetting what it's called uh, unqualified reservations i think anyway he kind of came up with this concept called the cathedral and michael malice has now taken and popularized this i think as well sort of entering into language it has to do with this idea that essentially there are these forces or institutions that are actually shaping opinion in a particular way for a particular outcome and at one point in time in history, the cathedral is actually like church and the state, you know, working together to produce these ends. Well, what happened is that academia and science or scientism sort of replaced the church and those powers now, and now it works with the state in order to produce an outcome. And the way it does it is it, it essentially brainwashes people with propaganda in order to get those people to voluntarily pull the levers, you know, in the voting booth to produce an outcome, right? So it's like it's like they're not taking over directly, but the the level of brainwashing and propaganda happening through the institutions of learning, public education, and then through regime media, and then the control of alternative media, it generates action in the the large populace that gets those people to actually do what they want. And so I believe, you know, Trump had to be removed because he was not an insider. He was really a third party candidate. He was anti-establishment. Did he have a, a, a great, Ron Paul's one of a kind in many ways, uh, because, you know, dude had a consistent worldview about the nature of power and freedom and liberty and such a depth of understanding. And it's like, that's one of the reasons I, I didn't like Gary Johnson. Gary Johnson would say freedom type stuff, but he didn't have a consistent worldview. Like, listen, hardly anybody does. D Donald Trump did not have a consistent worldview when it comes to liberty or freedom or any of these things. <laughs> He's just got a bunch of ideas. And it's like, but the thing is, is some of those ideas were really dangerous to the entrenched powers that see the U.S. government as the biggest corporation in the world in which they can get board seats and direct the flows of money and power to themselves. Like that's, it's just, that's as simple as it is in so many ways is it's like, this is just about control of the globe's largest corporation that has the ability to print money out of thin air. And so even where we're sitting right now and people are looking around at the inflation situation and whatever, it's like, yeah, guys, I recognize that we're only just experiencing the inflation under like the first set of stimulus under Trump right now. We haven't, I don't even think we've seen the impact of a lot of the stuff that's happened in the last 12 months. You know, it doesn't happen that fast. So I think we're in trouble and I think it's disingenuous to throw that at Biden's feet. But at the same time, like, let's not pretend that it's going to be anything but 10 X that uh, moving forward. And so you're right. It's like Trump, you know, he didn't, Trump didn't end the Fed. Trump didn't, you know, he still did things in foreign policy that weren't any good. Like there's aspects of things that he did that were, that were really non-libertarian and non-liberty oriented. And I think one of the most powerful things that happened was for the first time in history, you had a president who would basically tweet stream of consciousness when he was on the, on the toilet, you know? <laughs> and it's like, you know, that kind of transparency or look into the mind of a guy who's the sitting president of the United States, 
man, that's something I, I really miss, frankly. And I think a lot of Americans look at what they see now, which is, you know, focus group tested messaging coming out from a team of people uh, out, like that's all you get anymore. And that's all you would have gotten under Hillary Clinton. It's like we are looking for something different. And so I think a lot of what MAGA was about, a lot of what Trump was about is it was just he was a vehicle for an energy that's out there that says, we're tired of the insiders. We're tired of the establishment. The working class has been spit on by the Democrats and the establishment Republicans, and we want greater transparency in government. I think all that's good. And, and one last thing I will say is that because of Trump and because of things like Russiagate, Jan 6, all of this stuff, you have people on the conservative side who are way more open to this idea that the intelligence community is not their friend. That these guys are not like real protectors of America, but actually the opposite. And seeing what unfolded in Afghanistan, whether or not you agree that we should have glad we're out, even though it happened in a really difficult way. Like one of the things that I think a lot of conservatives also saw was like, dude, that was a big grift for 20 years. And, and then seeing what's happened within the military and sort of the excommunication of conservatives and like the embracing of like woke military stuff, again, that has made people on the conservative side of the aisle change some opinions about their view of military and intelligence community and then the media that we did not see when Ron Paul was running and was an obstacle to the true message of liberty getting through to some of these people. And I do think that it's a real, a real awakening moment for many of them. The um, realization by conservatives that even during the Trump administration, they still clung to this idea, well, the FBI is only bad at the top and the so-called rank and file are the true blue heroes that we've always thought they were. No, they never were. I mean, if you read, if you read Judge uh, Andrew Napolitano's books, they, I mean, entrapment is, that's their business and lying on the stand and all kinds of terrible things going all the way back to J. Edgar Hoover. Well, the one thing you mentioned uh, too that I miss about Trump was... Um, firing people on Twitter. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> yeah, I wish right. that would have stuck around. I mean, and that's another thing. Firing a high ranking official like James <laughs> Comey on Twitter is another sacrilege, right? So that, yes. that's a good thing. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, like I think that what many people oppose about Trump is like, it, he was doing what he was doing in a lot of ways was like he it was the equivalent of like walking through the White House and passing gas all over the place, like with what he was doing. He was just like a disgrace, you know, to the decorum. And it's like, dude, the most powerful weapon we have is to ridicule power. And then it needs to come down a freaking notch, you know, like we've all been waiting for that. And it's like so. Uh, on one hand, I think that's all great. Another thing I'll just mention is, you know, we just came out of the other side of the uh, Kyle Rittenhouse trial as we're recording this. And, um, you know, like, I think it, I think that's opening eyes to people of like, wait a minute, e even at the more local level, these prosecutors are not above board. What? It's like, guys, yes, let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Let's get more and more people to understand that, yes, at every level, Oh, yes. Those people, too. Oh, yeah. Those people, too. Those people, too. Like, so anything we can do to keep this train on track where it continues to delegitimize and it gets people to rec recognize, wait a minute, this is a big grift. I'm the mark. And now what do we do to change that? You know, that's when I think we can turn some things around. And for me, the January 6th narrative and the treatment of, of Jake Angeli, our film is going to be about something bigger than him. But he is going to serve as an avatar for what can happen when you have unconventional ideas, you look an unconventional way, and you find yourself at the center of a political prosecution, um, you know, and what, what Americans need to take away from that, both on the left and the right, and, and what can we do to stop this from becoming the norm, if we can. I don't know if we can. Yeah, sometimes it seems hopeless, and sometimes it seems... The worse the regime gets, the the more uh, the more eyes start to become opened. It's almost like that scene with Darth Vader and uh, Princess Leia at the beginning of the first Star Wars, where she says, "The more you tighten your grip, the more that slips through your fingers." Let's hope that's the case. Uh, how do people find out more about your film, and how do they support it? Yeah, well, so our our website for the film is Q Sent Me. 
uh, movie.com. That's Q sent me movie.com. You know, Jake was known for this sign. He would always carry saying Q sent me. And we, we will get into some of the weeds on the Q conspiracy, but, uh, it's, it's really not a, the movie's not about Q at all. I mean, there's a, there's a, it's like a little bit of a subplot. It's more about the events of Jan 6 and and the repercussions and what we've seen unfold in the past year. Um, so go there, check it out. We got a full trailer we just released. You know, we we kept a lot of this under wraps until Jake was sentenced because we didn't want to negatively or we just didn't want to impact the sentencing that was going to happen for him. His case was still open. And so, but we've released it now and we're out fully promoting this. People can sign up to learn more. We're also giving out like behind the scenes, other unreleased footage to people who sign up and we're hoping to release the film in the first part of 2022. I can't wait to see it, Jason, and I'll definitely post your links on my show notes page. And I hope you'll come back and let us know how things are going once it gets released. For sure, Tom. Good to talk to you, man. And I appreciate all you've done over the years uh, for the cause of liberty. Likewise. Talk to you soon. Okay, friends, that's going to do it for today. Don't forget to get a free copy of my new ebook, An Anti-State Christmas, at antistatechristmas.com. Of course, if you haven't already, subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you normally listen. And please do go to the Tom Mullen Talks Freedom website at tommullentalksfreedom.com and leave a review. And if you like the music you've heard on Tom Mullen Talks Freedom, you can hear more at TomMullenSings.com. Thanks for listening. The war of ideas has only just begun. Arm yourself with the knowledge you need by heading to TomMullenTalksFreedom.com and subscribing to our email list. And remember, every revolution starts in the minds of the people.